Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I hope everybody can hear me. I hope that my signal is good. My um, wife tells me that our internet is not acting the best, so hopefully. Am I coming through pretty good? Before I get started on this, am I coming through pretty good? Uh, you all tell me. Am I coming through good? Am I coming through good? Doesn't look like it. My numbers. Am I? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you? Signal's good? Yeah. All right. All right. We can rock and roll then. Glad about that. Hope everybody's doing well um, this evening. Uh, I have something I want to talk about. If you would, I'd love for you to uh, copy this link, share it to your Facebook pages. Uh, send it to your friends. This is um, this is a necessary discussion. There's a term that I use. I did not put it in the title because um, the algorithm or well the, the computers at uh, YouTube might flag the video, not understanding what it's about. But the term that I use in my books uh, is female slave conditioning, and usually. When I use that term for the first time with an audience, um, people are kind of taken back because maybe they've never heard it put in those terms. Terms, But female slave conditioning is what happens to uh, pretty much every little girl that grows up in the United States of America on some level. If she has a a present and healthy father, he may protect her from it and cover her. But society from the birth of the little girl, society intends to precondition the little girl to be manipulated and controlled by men. This happens in uh, education, religion, entertainment, Every sphere, the little girl is conditioned to believe a few things, that she's less than, she's conditioned to believe that she's less than uh, her male counterparts. And she's also conditioned to believe that um, her only value in life or her main value in life is her relational status. And so this little girl grows up uh, believing that she's subconsciously, she believes that she's less than men. She believes that the only way she can be worth something in this world is to have uh, a, a certain kind of relationship with men. And because she's conditioned to that, male society, watch this, teaches the little boys how to manipulate that indoctrination. And so the little girl grows, she's educated, um, she's successful, and yet she can't seem to wrap her arms around a serious or healthy relationship with men. And she grows into what I always describe as the PhD woman manipulated by the GED man, and she does not know why. She does not realize that she was set up for these failures. And so I call this female slave conditioning. And much of what I do, um, much of what I do with, with this book and the one that came before it, uh, the father-daughter talk, is to dismantle. What I do is I, I dismantle the lies and the false philosophies that women have to that keep them uh, subjugated and limited in terms of what they can accomplish in life. And this female slave conditioning, I think the greatest impact is that it continues to or it, it perpetuates a queen of a woman submitting to a clown of a man. Now, if you look in 2 Timothy 3, verses 6 and 7, and I'm reading from the Amplified. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate you. It says, for among them are those who 
worm their way into homes and captivate morally weak and spiritually dwarfed women weighed down by the burden of their sins, easily swayed by various impulses, always learning and listening to anybody who will teach them, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I, I, you know, 2 Timothy 3, 6, and 7, I believe, describes the condition of female slave conditioning. Um, I mean, I don't think it gets any better than that. Let me read it again. For among them are those who worm their way into homes, talking about unscrupulous men, and captivate morally weak and spiritually dwarfed women weighed down by the burden of their sins, easily swayed by various impulses, always learning and listening to anybody who will teach them, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know all of the principles, you know all of the lessons, but you're never able to actualize it. Now, but he uses a term here. He says, for among them are those who worm their way into homes and captivate or take, take captive morally weak and spiritually dwarfed women. This captivity is this captivity that perverted male society uh, exacts upon um, female slave conditioned, uh, slave conditioned women this captivity is facilitated through guilt and shame. A perverted male society takes a woman and makes her feel two things to manipulate her with, guilt and shame. Now, the same society that sets the woman up for the moral failures, the same society that sets the woman up for the moral failures is the same society that comes back and points, it, points its finger at the woman and raises guilt consciousness and shame consciousness because guilt and shame are like steering wheels to the soul. Once I can make you feel guilty, I can steer your life in any direction that I desire. That's one of the great downfalls of religion is that Religion, religious leaders have, have sought to use religion to produce guilt and shame to manipulate and to control rather than to free and to empower. His words are pure. So much I appreciate you. Now, so this is intentional. I want you to hear what I'm saying. This is intentional that the woman is set up from, from a little girl to have a subconscious mindset to be manipulated by a perverted male society. And what happens is the main agenda on, and, and I call this woman when a woman has been slave conditioned to, perverted, to a perverted male society, I call this state broken consciousness. And when, when a woman has broken consciousness, her main agenda is a relationship with a man. That's her main agenda. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, God made the woman for the man. God made man for woman. The two go together. They do. But when you are so consumed with, you know, a relationship with a man, you become a slave to a society that manages your thirst. If you look in Isaiah 4 and 1, listen to this very carefully. It says, and in that day, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. They're saying, you ain't got to financially provide for us. You don't have to do nothing for us. All we want you to do is just take us in. Let us have your name. Watch this. To take away our reproach. Because these women, this generation of women, was conditioned to believe that if I have a husband... I am a disgrace. 
And then they were conditioned to believe if I have a husband and don't have a child, I'm a disgrace. And then they were conditioned to believe if I have a husband, have a child, but never have a son for him, I'm a disgrace. You see how, you see how the consciousness has been warped to be manipulated and managed? And the sad reality is that women today in, in what some say is the most progressive age are not far off from this same kind of psychology. Where did they get this idea that if I don't have a man, it's a reproach? Society did that. Society gave them this idea that somehow you are broken and somehow you are uh, inferior because you don't have a man. So they say, you ain't got to do nothing for us. Just give us your name. Have sex with us and give us your name so that you can take away our reproach. And how many women today are running behind men because you feel like it's a reproach to be 35 or 40 or 50 and not have a, a man or 60 and not have a man? You feel, like, you feel like it's a disgrace for you to be of a certain age. Sally McEwen, thank you. I listen to you every day and have grown so much since I first found you at the end of last year. Thank you. I consider you and Lisa as my pastors. Thank you so much. That means the world to us, Sally. Now, let me read this. A part of the penalty, and you, you go back into Genesis and you look at Adam and Eve, because here's the question. Here's the question. Women quite often want to know, why is it that I have, why is it that you have such a desire for the man in your life and you can rarely, if ever, get a man to have the same kind of attraction towards you? Why is it that you, why is it that you give it everything you got and you, you seem to always end up with men that rarely give anything. Well, when you go back into the book of Genesis, Tema, thank you so much. I appreciate you. A part of the penalty for Eve's participation in Adam's disobedience, when God said, don't touch this particular tree, and Eve brought stuff to Adam and kind of talked him into it, a part of her a part of the penalty for her participation in Adam's disobedience was that God gave Eve, woman, watch this, a desire to please her man. And then God simultaneously gave the man a desire to manipulate the woman. So all of this was a part of the what? Curse. This was a part of, thank you, Angela. Hello, Pastor Blake. You are always an inspiration to me. Thanks for being you. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate it. That was a part of the curse. Let me read it for you. In Genesis 3 and 16, it says, He told the woman, I'll multiply your pains in childbirth. I'll multiply your pains in childbirth. You will give birth to your babies in pain. You'll want to please your husband, but he'll lord it over you. So there you have it. When you look at this this uh, strange dynamic between woman and man. Why is it that the woman bends over backwards? Why is it that the woman is um, self-sacrificing and the man is manipulative and controlling and abusive? It's because you go back to the original fall of mankind. This is the broken consciousness of men and women at work and at warfare one against the other. Now, how does this happen? How does, how does society condition the woman for manipulation? Number one, number one, if you're writing, if you, if you, if you writing, uh, write this down. If you're not, you need to get something to write with. Number one, there's a constant indoctrination intended to miseducate and misdirect the woman from a little girl. Constant indoctrination intended to miseducate and misdirect the woman 
from a little girl. If you look in Romans chapter 1, verses 25 and 26, it says, uh, who changed the truth more than the creator, who changed the truth of God rather into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So they, what happens is with a perverted generation of man, they change the truth into lie, and it brings, it brings society to a place where we call the truth a lie and we call lies truth. And so this begins to happen uh, when, when society constantly indoctrinates and miseducates the woman and misdirects the woman to believe a few things, you know, to believe that she's a sexual object. And you'd be amazed at how many women actually, actually believe that you're purely sexual. You, you don't give yourself credit for being intellectual. You don't give yourself credit for being spiritual. You don't see yourself as um, one ordained by God to dominate. You just see yourself as a sexual object. And the reason I know that's the way you see yourself is because that's the way you package yourself. Little, little girls, again, are preconditioned for domination. Now, watch this. This indoctrination centers around, listen to this very carefully. We said that it starts with how is the woman conditioned for manipulation. It starts with constant indoctrination intended to miseducate the woman. And this indoctrination centers around false societal standards of beauty and value. And these false societal standards of beauty and value become the lifelong pursuit of the broken woman. She's in pursuit of something, watch this, other than herself and hatred for her authentic self. Do you think that it is only that way when we live in sin and turn away from Christ? Because this is the ways of the world but if you live in Christ, then this can change, right? Absolutely, it can change. That's why, see, truth trumps lies. That's why I'm here teaching tonight. The Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, you see. But where religion has failed us, Rosh, Roshalen, did I say it right? Roshalen, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Seeking his face, thank you. You are the father I never had. God bless you. Please pray for me. I will certainly do that. So absolutely it can change. But let me read this again. This indoctrination centers around false societal standards of beauty and value that become a lifelong pursuit of something other than the woman herself and even an, a hatred for her authentic self. So what happens is society says to the black woman, you need to be lighter, you need to be thinner. And so the black woman spends her time trying to bleach, trying to run on the treadmill. And then society says to the white woman, you're too white. You need to uh, get a tanning booth and you need, to, uh, you need to darken your skin and you need to put something in your hair to make your hair curlier while the black woman is trying to make her hair straighter. The white woman is trying to make her hair curlier. The black woman is trying to get skinny. The white woman's at the uh, at, at the plastic surgeon getting implants, trying to get hips and and so you see it's madness. It's because this indoctrination centers around false societal standards of beauty and value that become a lifelong pursuit of something other than yourself and ultimately turns into a hatred for, for you and how God made you. That's when you know you have, that's when you know you're suffering from broken consciousness. When you look in the mirror and you hate what you see, or you're constantly in pursuit of becoming something other than you are. Thank you, Nia. You're suffering from broken consciousness. I was, um, I was, I was thinking just today, in fact. No, yesterday, actually. 
with all of this stuff going on, you know, all of this, this racial tension and everything, and everybody talking about how, you know, the world hates black people. I've been black for 55 years. Now listen to this, listen to this statement very carefully. I've been black for 55 years. And do you know, uh, I have never awakened not one day of my life, not for one second of my life, and said, I wish I was white. Or I wish I was Hispanic. Or I wish I was Indian. I have always embraced what God made me to be. Come on now. And see, when you're living your life as a woman in pursuit of something other than what the creator designed you to be, you're suffering from broken consciousness and you have been indoctrinated. You have been indoctrinated and miseducated and misdirected. Come on now. When you can settle for being somebody's uh, side chick or side piece, not to be vulgar. Number two. So number one, it starts with, it starts with a constant indoctrination that is intended to miseducate and misdirect. Number two, society then moves to this, to this point. Society makes her hate herself. Watch this. Society makes you hate yourself. This is how you are conditioned for manipulation. Society makes you hate yourself through impossible comparisons. Society will set these standards for you and then society will show you on this hand society says okay this is what you need to do to be a success or to be you know a woman of worth knowing that these are not things you can accomplish and then society will raise somebody else up in front of you and say see this is what I'm talking about right here knowing that it's impossible for you to become anything other than what you are and so you got, you have uh, one of you have you have a black sister, grandma had the hips, mama had the hips, great grandma had the hips, all the aunties got the hips, the sisters got the hips, and society says to you, well, you need to be a size three. Thank you, Robin. You need to be a size three if if you're gonna be you know considered of worth. And you running on that treadmill and you starving yourself and all of this kind of stuff. Babe, it ain't in your DNA to be no three. But see, society wants to get you to a place where you're chasing the impossible dream because it then becomes what? Again, the steering wheel in your soul that society can drive your life into whatever direction it desires to go or bring you into. So you have, you have men that Will, will set you up. You don't even realize you're being set up. You think you're in a relationship. You just then, you know, you're in a situationship. This is a transaction. This is a dude that's just trying to set you up. And 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 dude to start insinuating that you should do this and you should be that. And then he'll compare you to, well, see, like so-and-so over there. You, you, you should be more like her. And so now this gets, what, ingrained in your brain let me read this. Once she becomes, once, once the young girl becomes a young woman, the self, the self hatred is intentionally fertilized through constant comparisons. And these comparisons are made subliminally through glorified images of beauty, success, and relevance. Every time you turn on a music video, that society drawing comparisons. Every time you open a magazine or look on the cover of a magazine, you don't see anybody that looks like you. And I'm not talking about race. I'm talking about you, you, the people you see on the cover of magazines are flawless. They don't have stretch marks. They don't have no uh, cellulite. They don't have no lines in their face. And they don't tell you all that stuff is airbrushed. But that's society doing what? Breaking your consciousness. Conditioning you for manipulation. Now, if you look in Genesis 29, um, there you see Joseph's two, uh, Jacob's rather, two wives, Leah and Rachel. And in Genesis 29, verses 16 through 18, it says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, 
and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. You see how they're drawing these comparisons? Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you as a hired workman for seven years in return for the privilege of marrying Rachel, your younger daughter. It describes Leah as having weak eyes, and, and a lot of theologians say that was indicative of them calling Leah less attractive or ugly even, while it describes Rachel as beautiful in form and appearance. Society does that all the time. Society will raise up one person and say, now this is the standard of beauty. That's the standard in one part of the country. Then it'll raise up another standard of beauty over here. And then society will compare you to that. And you will, you will be driven insane by the comparisons. Now watch this. The men in her life the young girl, as she's being conditioned, the men in her life will constantly compare her to other women, never affirming her personal value. This will happen from one relationship to the next. Every man you get, you can see I'm bringing this out because I want you to be able to recognize it when you see it. Every man you get will be comparing you to his ex-woman or you'll be comparing you to a woman across the room or you compare you to a woman on the job, and the entire time this is going on, this is destroying your soul. Chatina, thank you so much. This is destroying your soul, and while you brush it off and shrug it off because you think it's not intentional, the reality is that in most cases it is very intentional. In most cases it is very intentional. Whenever you find a man that is depleting your soul, you need to put distance between you and that man. Either, watch this, either he is intentionally breaking your soul or he's too ignorant to cover you. But whenever a man has an impact on your life that you leave out of his presence, thank you, Jasmine, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to you and your lead. Y'all bless me in a major way. Currently taking the Queenology online program, session five. Thank you. I appreciate you. Make sure you let me know what you think. But whenever you leave out of a man's presence, feeling bad about yourself and, and looking at someone else as, as a standard for you to aspire to, you got the wrong man. The right man is not going to even compare you to his mama. Because when, when a man begins to draw comparisons, he is more than likely reaching into your soul that he might control and manipulate you. All right, number three. Number three, third step is that society makes her compete. Watch this. Okay, let me go back to one. Number one, we said that it starts with constant indoctrination that miseducates and misdirects you. Number two, society makes her hate herself through impossible comparisons, comparing you to people and, and, and you know, things that you, it's not even in the cards. It's, you, you're different, you're different. Uh, thank you, Riley, thank you so much. You are, you are a different creation, but here's number three. Uh, Cashwell, thank you so much. Make her compete with other women for affirmation and never give it to her. So, so, so the man will take and he'll draw these comparisons. He'll compare you to somebody else. And all of this, what, deteriorates your soul to the point that your self-esteem bank is emptied. And now he, he makes you compete with other women for affirmation, but he never gives it to you. You find yourself, you find yourself, he draws these comparisons to the point that you find yourself with many broken sisterhoods 
so dysfunctional that you don't even know how to get along with women. Like your women say, I just don't like women. Mm, you may need to check that out because you a woman. You may need to check that out because broken consciousness creates within the woman a competition with other women for the affirmation of men that will never get it. They put you on this uh, this treadmill, this approval, I call it the approval trap, where you're constantly doing things, waiting for the affirmation or the approval from this man, and he never delivers it. And you're constantly competing with all of the women in your, in your, in your circle. You, on the job, you're competing for the affirmation of, you know, whoever the boss is, if he's a man. Now, I wrote this, this is how a man subjugates a woman sexually. He hates her and yet uses her for sex. He makes, again, number three, makes her compete with other women for affirmation and never gives it to her. He, he, he withholds affirmation. He, it's, almost like, it's almost like a drug dealer that gives a, a, you know, a person a little bit just to get them hooked. And he never, you know, he, he just keeps them strung out. Well, when a, when, when, when a man comes to number three, where he, he makes her compete with other women for affirmation and never fulfills it, it's like the text says, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. The more you long for it and don't have it, the sicker you become. And this is how many times women find themselves in sexual positions and relationships with men that should have never had a conversation. Thank you, Tiff. Bishop and Lady Blakes, you all are anointed to do this work, changing my life, enlightenment. Thank you so much. This is how you find yourself involved in sexual relationships that you, you wake up one day and you say, how in the world did I get here? This doesn't even represent my values. This is against my ethics. This is against my upbringing. Affirmation. You're, you're, you're thirsting for affirmation and it's never delivered. And, it, and society creates this competition between you and other women. Look what the Bible says uh, going, back to, going back to Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. He, he was married to both Rachel and Leah. He loved Rachel, but he hated Leah. And listen to what the Bible says. I'm trying to show you how, they, how society creates this competition between, between sisters. In Genesis 29, 30 through 35, it says, he, And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bare a son. And she called his name Reuben, for she said, listen to what she says, Surely the Lord had looked upon my affliction. What was her affliction? Her husband hated her. He loved, he loved Rachel, but hated her. So she has a child. She says, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. She's thirsting for what? The affirmation of this man. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again. She's doing all of this trying to when the, you know, the approval of this man and she's competing with her sister and she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again and bare a son and she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. But you see how, you know, the, the hatred of this man created within her a competition against her sister and an insatiable desire to win this man's approval. She got caught up in the approval trap because society will make you compete with other women for affirmation and, and never give it to you. So when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're impacted by this, you, you tap into stuff like you can't celebrate your sisters when, when they go up. To, to see them go up, you view that as uh, a reflection on you. 
if your sister gets a, a you know a significant relationship that turns into marriage, you can't you can't even celebrate that because you have this silent competition. Now number four. This is this is the next thing that will happen is that they will abuse her emotionally. Society will abuse her emotionally, mentally and physically until dysfunction becomes her norm. Society will abuse her until dysfunction becomes her norm. Till your normal becomes dysfunctional. Society will continue to abuse you as a woman until you don't know the difference anymore between right or wrong. You don't know the difference between up or down. You don't know the difference between good or bad. You can't even you if 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 a great relationship showed up at your front door and knocked on the door, you wouldn't be able to recognize it because you have been abused so long that dysfunction has become your norm. And see, all of that that we've gone through, one through three, all of that's abuse. All of that's emotional abuse, making her compete with other women for affirmation and never giving it to her, making her hate herself through impossible comparisons, constantly indoctrin indoctrinating her or miseducating and misdirecting her. All of that's emotional abuse. And, and what society does is it, it continues to abuse and abuse and abuse and abuse until you get to a place where dysfunction becomes your normal. That normal feels uncomfortable for you. Thank you, Gwen. That a healthy man, a whole man, even a real man, is not even attractive to you. You've been so conditioned by Dogs, you don't know how to live without fleas. There's a woman in John 4, verses 16 through 19, that I always talk about, and this is the amplified version. It says, at this Jesus said, and I'm taking, up, taking it up in the middle of a conversation between her and Jesus. Thank you, Deborah. Your teachings freed me from soul ties. I had many hurdles to overcome as a former foster child, but God uses my life to bless others. Thank you. God bless you, Deborah. I appreciate you. It says, at this, Jesus said, go call your husband. He's talking to this woman at the well and come back. The woman answered, I do not have a husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I do not have a husband. For you have had five husbands and the man you are now living with is not your husband. You have said this truthfully. The woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. So Jesus says, you, you, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five different men. And the one you've got now that you're you, you living with, he's not your husband. Well, the question is, how did this woman continue? True Despina, thank you so much. How did this woman continue to keep falling into the same situation? Dysfunction had become her norm. Dysfunction had become, thank you, Tony, you are educating the church on levels that other leaders aren't touching. Just curious as to why you even began teaching women about manipulation and narcissism. You have pointed us back to God every time. I'm going to answer that for you when I'm done. And uh, if, I for, if I look like I'm forgetting, y'all remind me. I want to answer that for you. But we see how dysfunction had become her norm. And Jesus had to what? Put it right between our eyes. And said, you said, right, you don't have no husband. You had five of them. And the man you're living with now is not yours. You've gotten comfortable in dysfunction. It had become her norm. Now, listen to what the Holy Spirit said to me. Sex is a tool of emotional abuse when it's passed off as love. Under four, we're talking about how society abuses her emotionally, mentally, and physically until dysfunction becomes her norm. There are some of you who are engaged in consensual sexual relationships and it is as much abuse as uh, 
molestation or rape. Because the person that you're sleeping with is passing off the sexual act as though it is love and you are believing it. You are being emotionally abused. And, and you, have, you have accepted a sexual experience as love because society has made you believe that love and sex are synonymous. And so there are times that women are engaged in consensual sexual relationships and are yet being abused and don't even realize it because it is just driving, it is driving you deeper and deeper and deeper into a dysfunctional norm. Thank you, Pam. Hi, R.C. Blakes. I love watching you. This is for you and Lisa to have lunch on me. Keep teaching, building, and uplifting women. You helped me straighten my crown. It tilted but did not fall off. A good word matters. Thank you so much, Pam. I appreciate you. It is driving you further and further into a dysfunctional norm. Like, it's amazing to me. Okay, can I just talk like a father? Please, can I just talk like a dad, like a big brother, like a pastor? It's amazing to me how loose and casual women are today about sleeping with men that it's amazing to me and and I sit there and I try to have these because you know I'm not the kind of pastor that's going to um, just beat you over the head with the Bible you're going to know exactly what I feel and what I think but I'm the kind of pastor that I want you to be able to tell me the real I don't want you to lie to me and then go out in the street and do something different. I want you to feel comfortable enough to tell me the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm like your lawyer. I can't help you unless you're telling me the truth. And, and, and many women, when we have these conversations, it's like having sex with a dude ain't no big deal. I'm like, okay, so giving your body to a man that has not earned it is no, it's no big deal. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I'm realizing that this is from years and years and decades and decades of emotional abuse that has created a dysfunctional norm in your mind for you to believe as a woman the most precious thing God has ever made. It, 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 is, it, is, it is the fruit of, of the seeds of dysfunction that have been sown through constant abuse emotional abuse that makes you believe that it's no big deal to give your body to a man that you ain't married to. It's no big deal. You know, we, we, we dated, we, we've been out on a date three times. How many times you got to go till you get married? Till you get married. I mean, if, if, if you know, you at least wait till you get engaged, at least, at least be engaged. Publicly. At least do that. Listen, listen to what the Holy Spirit said to me. Sex is the world's greatest hallucinogenic. Sex. Thank you, Shadana. I appreciate you. Sex is the world's greatest hallucinogenic. It is used to make the woman perfectly comfortable with disrespect and dishonor by casting the illusion of love. Pretty puppy, thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for standing up for women and educating us on how we have been conditioned by society to be low value. Thank, thank you, we can, uh, thank you, we can bring up our daughters to be queens. God bless you and your family. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate you. Uh, Ms. Carter, I just want to let you know that you are certainly heaven sent. I really appreciate all your messages. God knows I do. I have grown tremendously and spiritually. Everything I learn from you, I share with my two young daughters. Thank you, sir. That's the point. Thank you, Felicia. I want, I want the babies to, to understand before we get started before they get started in life. Let me read this again. 
Sex is the world's greatest hallucinogenic. It is used to make the woman perfectly comfortable with disrespect and dishonor by casting the illusion of love. And it becomes what? Just another means, another tool for emotional abuse. And then number five, and then I'm done. Number five. Let's, let's go through them again. Number one, we said, was or is that society constantly indoctrinates the woman to miseducate and misdirect her. Number two, we said, Society makes her hate herself through impossible comparisons. Number three, society makes her compete with other women for affirmation and never gives it to her. Number four, society abuses her emotionally, mentally, and physically until dysfunction becomes her norm. She knows nothing other than dysfunction. And then number five, society misdefines her with labels. Thank you, AJ. Can you do a video on how abused mothers can teach their daughters not to go down the same route and also on how to not pass on the same abuse and trauma to their children? I have been in three abusive relationships. That's a great one there. I would love for you to email me of that. That's a great one. Uh, you can email me at pastorrcblakes at gmail.com. Send that to me. I'd love, I'd love to look into doing that. Number five, society misdefines the woman with labels. Society uses labels. Society uh, uses labels like fat. Okay, okay, okay. Watch this. Let me show you how it works. You were uh, three months ago before the quarantine. You were... Uh, 125 pounds soaking wet. Three months later, after the quarantine, you are 130 pounds soaking wet. It says, oh, you're getting fat. And that label sticks to your brain and you obsess over it. Or society says, uses labels like stupid, or, you know, um, getting old, getting older, you, you know, something like that, you know. When, when, when you're going to get a man, you know, getting over the hill. You, 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 labels, labels to what? Misdefine you. You have to become a woman that rises above the labels and you can't allow people to use labels to bring your consciousness down. You have to define yourself from within according to the creators. Come on now. You must define yourself according to the creators definition of who you are and what you are and you you are not you are not to be labeled. You know who you are. Your, your heavenly father, your creator, define you. And you live according to that definition alone. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 and 4, a soothing tongue speaking words that build up and encourage is a tree of life. But a perversive tongue speaking words that overwhelm and depress crushes the spirit. And that's what labels do. That's what labels do. So this is, you know, I, 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 I bring these kinds of teachings to you because the more I teach it, the more you will be able to recognize it when it's happening. Because these things are, this, this is going on all the time. Some of you are going to get off of this live tonight and you're going to get on the phone with Homeboy and you're going to find where, where he's trying to do some of this very stuff, right? He's trying to indoctrinate you. He's uh, trying to compare you. You're going to find where he's trying to create a competition for affirmation. You're going to, you're going to find it. You're going to see it showing up in, in, in your life. And when you begin to recognize it, 
you can cut it off. The reason so many women are so uh, significantly, severely impacted negatively by these things is because most women have not been prepared to recognize it. And it's kind of like a mind game that goes on. And by the time you wake up and realize you're in something, you're like caught up in the world of it. And emotionally, you've lost yourself. But when you can recognize the enemy's tactics and you can recognize what the devil is trying to use to destroy your queen consciousness, it is then that you can resist. Thank you, Terry. I will be tithing to your ministry from now on. I showed my pastor your videos. He said you should do a pastor's conference, laugh out loud. Oh boy, you've restored my walk with God and I will not waste my pain. Thank you, pastor. And tell your pastor I said thank you. I appreciate you. So listen, those are just my thoughts for this evening. Um, let me pray for you before I let you go. Father, I thank you for... I thank you for this word. I thank you for this revelation. I thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl that might be listening to this. Now, Father, I thank you for the anointing. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit, let it register, dear God, and let your people sense your presence tonight. Whenever they might be listening to this, let them sense your presence and God, I know that there's somebody on the other end of this connection that's weeping and crying because they've seen so much of themselves in what we've talked about. Father, I thank you now for bringing calm to that storm. I thank you for bringing healing to that pain. I thank you for bringing healing to that pain. And now, God, there's some that don't even know you. They don't know you like I know you. Father, I thank you for supernaturally just moving into that room, that space where they are, and letting them sense, maybe for the first time, the peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. There was no number six and seven. There was just five. Now, back to the question that um, I'm supposed to answer. What was the question again? Um... Let me see if I, what was the question again? Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, let me see, maybe that's it. Uh, I'm still looking for it. Still looking for it. I'm trying to find the question that I'm supposed to be answering. You all just bear with me. Uh, I can't. I won't go back any further. Put the question up for me one more time. Let me see. So many on here. Okay. Why you decided to focus on narcissism? Okay, there it is. The reason I decided, the reason I started teaching uh, on narcissism um, relative to women, I wrote a book entitled Soul Ties, Breaking the Ties That Bind. And the more I studied, the more I realized that um, what, I, what I wrote about in the father-daughter talk, what I wrote about in soul ties, and then I started studying this thing relative to narcissism. I, narcissism, I saw how it all tied together. And then I began to see how um, generations of men have been conditioned with narcissistic strategies. Even if they are not narcissists themselves, they are taught the, the tricks of narcissists to control and to manipulate women emotionally and psychologically. So when you take a man like myself with my history of being a womanizer, well, I learned that stuff from men. And then when I started looking at 
you know, narcissism, I started realizing that one can be trained to behave narcissistically for the purposes of controlling and manipulating others. Now, you know, one's, um, one's human spirit, if he, is, is, he or she is well-adjusted, will pull them back from the edge, whereas the narcissist does not have that reservation. But I started seeing how women are being played and have been played for generations because men have been trained and armed with narcissistic strategies. And I believe that God has just given me a, a heart, a father's heart, not only for women, but definitely for women, because I believe that it is the natural inclination of a man to protect the women in his world. Okay, if, if somebody's in the, in, the, in the house fighting and they want to jump on my daughter or my son, I love both of them equally, but I'm not jumping to the defense of my son. If I can only do one, I'm going to defend my daughter because it's the natural inclination of a man to defend the women in his life. So I think it was birthed out of the transformation that God has done in my life, the revelation that God has given me relative to these subjects and these issues, and um, just an overall desire to people live better and, you know, not be um, subjugated unnecessarily. And so I'm not just called to thank you, Mary, to women. I just got through with the book. Um, Kingology. This is for the men. This is the deal with the, you know, a, a broken generation of men. So I'm not just about women, but God has definitely given me uh, a mandate to speak into the lives of women and empower women around the world to grab hold of that consciousness and to rise out of the very stuff that we just got through talking about tonight. But I believe that's where it came from. Thank you, Cheryl. I believe that's where it came from. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. And uh, it's, it, you know, needless to say, my, my email is loaded with questions about narcissism all day long, not just from women. Sometimes it's men that are dealing with narcissistic women. And so I hope that answers your question. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's where it comes from. God just kind of planted that thing in my spirit. And in fact about it, when I first started speaking to the empowerment of women, people didn't understand it. You know, uh, pastors were like, man, okay, when you go, when you gonna get off of this kick? And it wasn't a kick. You know, as I started dealing with it, I realized that we have lost generations of women because, thank you, Karen, because no one has taught them, no one's had that father-daughter talk with them to teach them how to function in a perverted male society that views them as prey and is using all of these games that we discuss, using all of these games to manipulate and control. And so it's not a kick, it's, it's, it's a ministry and it's most necessary to save a generation of women. And believe it or not, there are a lot of men that love what I'm teaching and the men take what I teach the women and they challenge themselves and they become better men as a consequence. So it's something God gave me. I guess that's the, that's the short of it all. All right, I, I've had you all on here for one hour. I love you. I appreciate you. I thank God for you. Uh, don't forget to stop by my website, rcblakes.com. Uh, Queenology, the online program, Soul Ties online program, Transcending the Father Womb, the online program, um, uh, Wisdom for Women in Ministry uh, online program. It's all there. And the most expensive one is $49. And it's, it's, it's an amazing value, I promise you. And uh, don't forget, if, if you've not... Tell the brothers I need them to, to pick up this. It's on Amazon. It's at Amazon now. You can buy the book. And I did it all at the same time. The book and the workbook or the study guide 
for the for the brothers. This I think would be a great tool for mothers of young single mothers of young men sit down and do this work together and uh, we're going to raise up manhood in this generation okay am i missing anything am i missing anything I, i'm sure i am i love y'all i love y'all i love y'all oh somebody say father's day gift that is true huh i i i need you on my marketing team that's true yeah this would be this would be a great father's day present um, the book and the study guide. And if those of you that have my study guides from uh, Queenology or Father Daughter Talk, you know how it goes. Um, maybe I should just close this up and let y'all go. But you're going to have key scripture. You're going to have principles to remember. I'm going to list all of the principles from every chapter. You're going to need to do this work. I suggest doing it after you read the chapter. Principles to remember. Questions to answer. And these, these questions can be used for group discussion or for personal devotions. Actions to take. Suggested ways to help the principles and truths come alive in your life and in the lives of those you love. And then personal declaration. Memorize each of these and repeat them daily. That's how every uh, chapter of the workbook or the study guide uh, is laid out. Yeah, you have all of the principles to remember. All right, I love you all. Thank you so much for, for your uh, support. I appreciate you. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you real soon. I think I'm coming back this week, and we're going to deal a little, talk a little bit about Kingology. I'll let you know beforehand, though. Have a great one. I'll talk to you real soon.